not only was I receiving hatred from the right in my country, but I was receiving awards and praise from the left. So I was getting like more and more radicalized and feeling like if I didn't please everyone and piss off the right people, then I was a bad person. And, and art making, you know, under that amount of scrutiny, I wasn't really able, I didn't feel like I could play anymore. Anna Salkovitz, welcome Hi. to How the Light Gets In. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so your public image has largely been shaped by your sexual assault survivor story and uh, the performance art pieces that came in response to that. What were you trying to achieve with uh, that bit of performance art and why did you choose that medium to tell your story? Um, wow, okay, this is a throwback question. Um, after the assault, um, I didn't tell anyone. Uh, I, except for, you know, my closest friends, they gossiped, word spread. And then uh, I was at a party and a girl came up to me and she was like, I heard about what happened. Um, the guy who did that to you did the same thing to me. And then she'd also heard some rumors about other women and we went on this kind of like detective journey where we contacted the other women and found out that there were actually six of us who'd all been assaulted by the same guy. So we reported our cases to the school and the police and they did nothing. Um, so really I was in a position where nothing was going to be done. Like my fate had already been decided and um, I had always been interested in art. I really believed that art, good art was supposed to effectively communicate uh, you know, your emotional state, some experience you've had. And so I just wanted to make art about what had happened. I mean, there was really, I think a lot of people, when they ask that question, when they ask me, uh, what were you trying to accomplish or what, you know, what were, were your motivations, I think, there's this assumption that there were some sort of ul you know ulterior motives, but really I I just was trying to make an artwork about. It's like if someone were really hurt um, and they wanted to make a song about their breakup, you don't ask them like, so were you trying to get back together with him by right? Like no, it's just this is how I felt, and I thought that art is supposed to communicate how you feel. Uh, so I thought that um, I was at this artist residency. It was a very prestigious artist residency out in the middle of nowhere, Connecticut, and I had never made artwork before that wasn't assigned to me by my teachers. Uh, so I made this very boring and bad video where I was filming myself dancing in a room, and uh, I was like, okay, how do I make this better? Because it sucks. So I asked one of my friends at the residency to film me setting up for this video and taking everything apart at the end. Um, and when I reviewed that footage, I was really interested in this one moment. It just was curious to me, where I was clearing the furniture out for the furniture out of the room to film in there, and I uh, was moving the bed out. And I was like, "Oh, that's interesting to just like watch my body at these angles, dealing with this mattress. I don't know why. I really didn't know why, but I was like, I want to explore that further. And I asked her to film me carrying it carrying the mattress further out, out of the house and onto the front lawn. And it was even more interesting to watch. I was like, wow, there's such a struggle to bring this bulky object out of the bedroom and into the light. And I was just fascinated by it. Again, no like, how do I create an artwork that will commute? Like, you know, I was just like, that's interesting. Let me follow that. Um, and then I thought like, what, 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 why is this interesting to me? Oh, maybe because the mattress represents the weight of what I endured. Maybe it represents the weight of, you know, all of survivors must endure. And then I was like, well, to make it even clearer, to make it an even better artwork, I should do it at Columbia, right? So this is kind of how it came about. There was never a moment where I was like, sorry, it's a long answer, but it's complicated. No, it's great. <laughs> do you think that a lot, of, uh, a lot of art is like that? That the sort of, it kind of people produce these things and then the stories about them are kind of retrospective. We understand art mm. after it's been produced rather than start out with a plan of what this piece is going to be about and what it's going to mean and then carry it out. 
I think I think nowadays, um, I mean, I, I, I've taught at the graduate level, you know, for art, and I've been in so many art classes and been around a ton of artists who are in art school and whatever. And I think so many people are taught, you know, okay, come up with what your artwork is about and then figure out how to make it. So people will be like, okay, I'm going to make an artwork about loneliness and modern day society. And then they end up with like a stick leaning against the wall. And then that's why you go to an art, a college art exhibition and you see like 50 sticks leaning against the wall. Right. But when I, teach or when I work with artists, I really try and push them to just follow the weird intuition you have. Don't, don't come in with preconceived notions about the art you want to make. Just like, you know, oh, you happen to be really interested in collecting socks? I know that's not artwork for you, but can you follow that weird thing you're interested in and see where it takes you and consider why you're interested in that? I try to have people do it I mean, that's my method, to follow the kind of like inexplicable impulse and then retrospectively see why you were interested in that in the first place. Mm. So I, I, put, I push that. <laughs> and what about sort of the issue of sort of social change, especially with art pieces that are explicitly touching upon something that is um, a political issue or a social issue of the time, you know, is it reasonable to expect art to change the world? Or is that a naive <laughs> No, ambition? it's ridiculous. And I can't believe <laughs> anyone has ever thought such a thing. <laughs> um, I, uh, I mean, I really did not set out to change the world when I did mattress performance. I, I didn't think anyone was going to give a shit about <laughs> my stupid artwork. <laughs> um, but I think it's what it speaks to is that if you can create an artwork that succinctly expresses something you're feeling in a way that is clear and um, communicable, then it will speak to people mm. because, you know, we're all humans and we've all suffered something in our lives. So I think that's when artwork can really touch people and move them. And I mean, I think that's when artwork starts to become more powerful than you could have ever thought. And do you think that's the reason why kind of explicitly political art or art that sets out <laughs> to be political often kind of leaves us quite cold? <laughs> because it has that sort of instrumental yeah, so element from the start. I, yeah, I think that's the word. It's I, It becomes like instrumental, yes, propagandistic even. like. I'm so interested in people just following their weird instincts, you know, um, whatever makes them tick. Because ultimately, I think if you follow that to its logical conclusion, there's something that about that that is going to resonate with people, and it's going to inevitably become quite political. But um, yeah, I, I don't. I mean, there's value in in art that's very instrumental in that way, but I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not someone who works in that, in that way. <laughs> okay, let's talk about, let's talk about something I heard you say earlier uh, in the debate on the, this kind of issue of change and control and mm. the, the fact that when you made that artwork, you felt like, well, the institutions aren't going to change, or at least they're not going to change anything when it comes to this particular case. Yeah. So, so it was a kind of way of changing something you could change, which is your, your yourself or... Yeah. So is it a way of asserting control? Is creativity a way of kind of impacting the world in, in maybe smaller ways than, you know, we originally maybe imagine we should be changing the world? Yeah. Yeah, I was saying, saying that, you know, we really only have control over ourselves and our reactions to things. Um, you know, if I set out to try and fix this person, change that institution and um, help these 10 people, I'm going to fail in all in every way. <laughs> um, I think that uh, that I'm much more interested in um, 
doing the work I need to do on myself um, and hoping that that in and of itself is inspiring to others. Um, and uh, I think that inspiring others is much more powerful than trying to change, control, or fix others. How do you, how do you escape such a very personal art like yours from becoming a bit solipsistic, right? Being too self-referential, mm -hmm. too much about, you know, your own experiences or your own references that maybe are going to be a bit opaque to the rest of the world. I know this is something often told to young poets when they start out, you know. You're to start not to, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so how, because there's this kind of interesting contradiction in your work, which is both kind of intensely polit sort of personal, but also has this kind of like wider um, sort of impact and, 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 and resonates with people. So how, how does art balance the two, the kind of very personal and the universal? Um, I make no claims to not be a total narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> But I think that actually, okay, I'm going to say something I hope is not, you know, whatever. Maybe it's con it's controversial and maybe all three of you will hate me for saying this. No, we but, like controversy. All right, great, great, So, <laughs> you know, when, uh, have you ever met those people who say, oh, I'm an empath and I'm surrounded by narcissists in my life and they're all vampires sucking my energy and woe is me, I'm an empath. Um, I worry that only narcissists talk that way. <laughs> like, like uh-oh, this is starting to sound like, actually, you're the narcissist, maybe. <laughs> so um, <laughs> to avoid that, I just act like a narcissist all the time because I feel like it's the, to make fun of the whole situation is the only way to actually not be narcissistic. So, I mean, I'll often, like, toot my own horn or, like, act act like I'm the center of the world, but I, I only make those jokes because I know that I'm definitely not, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, so I guess like, uh, I recognize that contradiction and I think it's kind of unavoidable. So you have to lean into it. So basically. you've got to lean into it and make it funny, <laughs> at the very least. Right. I think play is the only way around these things. When it comes to, again, the sort of like art that has a kind of moral content or political content, what role in how we evaluate art does the kind of moral or political content of it play? Like, can we separate the message of a piece of art from its like aesthetic or other qualities or do the two kind of oh, always man. go together? You know, I think I'm just at a point now, I'm old, I'm 29, I, I'm just not interested in valuing art or like putting a valuation on art like I I think you know if you see something and you like it then I'm happy you found it like I'm happy your day just got better you know I'm not here to say I, I, I'm not interested in, in going around being like well this is a good artwork and that's a bad artwork like and and also I think that you know as much as I say like you know before we were talking about which what my artistic process is versus what you know, an artistic process that does not resonate with me. But um, I really believe it's important for people to make bad art because if you don't make bad art, you're never gonna make good art, you know? And, and oh my God, how I've made some bad art, you know? But if I never did that, I would have never learned, all, learned from all those mistakes. Like, okay, well that didn't speak to anyone, which is why it's sitting in a closet somewhere. Well, let me try. Let me try something different next time. What so. makes what makes a piece of art bad, other, other than the fact that people don't like it, or, um, or is that the measure of the success of an art piece? I guess I'm, what I'm saying is, uh, I wish everyone would just chill out and make whatever the fuck they want to make, you know, <laughs> and stop trying so hard to to be the best all the time. Like, I, I'm such a fan of mediocre art. I think it's so, like, I'm so happy that people are taking risks, making mistakes. Um, yeah, go bad art. <laughs> it's the kind of, like, Beckett kind of, you know, you need to fail and, and yeah. fail again and fail in better ways. Or Yeah, and I wish people wouldn't be punished for, for making shit, you know? Um, so what's your what's your relationship to art now? You've mentioned in an interview previously that you were leaving the art world. Are you are you 
Have you have you left that? Is that behind you? Or are you back into it? What's what's the current yeah, situation? Yeah, I mean, I haven't really felt the need to make artwork since I. I mean, um, you know, after making Master's performance and uh, becoming kind of the figurehead of this budding political movement, um, I I lost a lot of freedom. You know, I not only was I receiving hatred from the right in my country, but I was receiving awards and praise from the left. So I was getting like more and more radicalized and feeling like if I didn't please everyone and piss off the right people, then I was a bad person. And, and art making, you know, under that amount of scrutiny, I wasn't really able, I didn't feel like I could play anymore. I, it felt like drudgery. And, you know, I'd always loved art because it was this space of freedom for me and this place where I could be weird and creative. And um, once I lost that, I was like, I don't really, you know, I'm not interested in it anymore. So lately um, I've been um, getting a master's of science in uh, Chinese medicine um, and learning how to give treatments to patients. And I've actually found a new space for creativity. Um, one day I had this one patient and I was like, I'm just bored of giving the same boring ass treatments over and over again. I, I need to have some fun. And um, I remember sitting there, I have these two assistants and I was like, okay, I'm going to do like five acupuncture points, but we need to do something kind of weird and cutesy. Um, so I took a cue from another teacher I'd had and I was like, I'm, we're going to do like an energy thing. So you put one hand, your, you know, your hand on his hand like this. And then you, the other assistant put your hand like this, and then you're both gonna cross your hands over his heart, and I'm gonna mess up the microphone, and and we're gonna like send him good energy. But I need you guys to like prepare for this. So they were like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So they were like meditating and getting their chi ready, their you know, the Chinese word for energy. And then we did this like very performance art esque energy transfer for him, and the treatment was just so much more powerful. And I know it was kind of bullshit, but just having everyone engage in this performance art piece for, you know, to me, it's a performance art piece to them. It was a, you know, an energy transfer or whatever. It just, it was like exciting and thrilling. And like, I realized that actually there's a ton of room for creativity and the next treatment I gave, I was like, you know what, I'm going to come up with another kind of like mini performance based on this person's story and their trauma for this person. What, what do you, how do you think of the relationship, as it were, between art and, and healing? Are the two connected in any other in any way beyond kind of the way that you've explored in, in alternative kind of uh, medical treatments? Like, if we look at art in itself, does that does that have a kind of healing capacity? Um, yeah, um, there's this essay by Giorgio Agamben that I read in college and then I couldn't find it for many years and then I finally found it again like a few weeks ago but I haven't had a chance to reread it so I'm probably not going I'm probably going to misrecount it uh, but in it he talks about the role of the contemporary as someone who kind of stands outside of society and is able to perceive all of it and from that kind of position they're able to actually um, distill it into something that's meaningful for society. So the artist is able to, for example, be so receptive to everything that's happening in society that they can distill it into something um, like simple and meaningful to everyone. Um, that's, you know, his, you know, that's aspirational, you know, that's what, that's what we should aspire to be. And, um, I've, I've always tried to do that, like in my art, like how can I not impose my views on the situation, but be so receptive to everything that I'm perceiving that it, you know, magically distills into an artwork. And I feel like in, in my healing practice, I'm doing the same with my patients. Like someone sits in front of me and I'm listening to their story. I'm also looking at the lines on their face. I'm seeing the way they hold their arms, I'm seeing the way they breathe. 
um, listening to the sound of their voice. And all of this information is informing me on how I'm going to proceed with the treatment in the way I speak, in the way I walk around the room, you know, all sorts of things. So it's, so art and healing, they're really, to me, it's really similar. Mm. Going back to something you mentioned earlier about how kind of the celebrity status that you acquired sort of uh, was a hindrance to your creativity. Do you think that's true of, of all kind of celebrity culture when it comes to art? Is that, have we reached a point when there's so much exposure and people become so scrutinized through, I don't know, social media and people following them all the time yeah. that it actually is detrimental to, to creativity? Um, you know, I think it can be. Looking back, I, I think had I been older and wiser, um, maybe I would have found a way to carve, carve that space out for myself. Um, but I think I was so young and impressionable that I felt like I had to be on all the time and taking every interview and giving every speech and all this stuff. Um, I mean, the last time I, I, I spoke publicly, I think was like at this festival, like maybe three or four years ago. So I think I reached a point where I was like, okay, you know what? I'm able to create these boundaries for myself, take a step back and build some privacy for myself. Um, like, I think I'm coming back out into the public eye because I'm pretty excited about what I've learned during that period of time that I went into a cave and hid. <laughs> um, and so I wouldn't make a blanket statement about you know what pu publicity does to everyone. Rather, I would think about the ways in which it's really important when you are in that position of publicity to intentionally carve out some privacy for yourself and remember to like do self-care, blah, blah, blah. And what have you learned in your four years in your, in your dark cave? <laughs> in my convalescence. I think I, I went on a crazy adventure where I spoke with people who really hated me, um, but I was ready at that point to approach them with a smile and you know, a genuine desire to get along. Um, and I learned that change doesn't happen overnight. Um, there's no use in being upset with people if they don't understand you the first time around, um, which taught me patience, which taught me patience. So uh, I was able, you know, once you learn that, you can talk with people who you really disagree with and be patient as they open up, you know, without trying to force the matter. Another way of saying it is in Chinese philosophy, one of the fundamental concepts is that uh, change is the only constant in this universe. So in Western philosophy, um, it's very, our, our grip on reality is very rigid, right? Like if um, this arm of the chair is a rectangular shape, it means it's not a circle, it's not round. Um, but in Chinese philosophy, the fact that it's a rectangular shape means that it has the potential to become a circle someday. Everything has the potential to change, and I think that um, often in politics, we don't remember that, we lose sight of that. We, we treat people as if, like, okay, you're wrong, so you suck. It's like, okay, well, in the Eastern philosophy, maybe they're wrong today, they could be right tomorrow, they, you know, or maybe it'll take them 10 years to figure it out. But um, there's no use in getting so upset when people, it, when people take a bit of time, you know? Emma Salkovitz, thank you for taking the time. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>